I just started the recording. Okay. Super. Thank you. So, okay. Well, let's. Uh, is anyone okay with using the hackmd.io? I see that there there are already ten people in the hackmd. I'm not sure how you actually edit the thing there. Ah, okay. Uh -huh. Sorry. I saw it. I, I saw it. There is a a, a small a pen in the upper left corner, and then you have you can have the edit. Okay, so it's like this. Yeah. Yeah, that one or the one next to it are both good. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's get started then. Uh, so um, I'm going to start with uh, with the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. This is an interim meeting of the LP1 uh, working group. Uh, it is a special interim for many reasons, and one of them is that it is uh, the one that uh, uh, where we are going to be discussing a lot of the things which we uh, were about to discuss at the ITF 107. So uh, it is our big meeting of of the of this of the first quarter, and uh, uh, we would like to also welcome our new AD uh, Eric Vinke, um, and. We'll, uh, and we'll uh, okay, uh, and, and we'll, we'll say a couple of words more. HackMD requires login. Hmm. Oh, yes, it requires login. Yes, okay. I mean, I can't create a user and take minutes. I mean, that, that's a problem. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll sign in with, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. you can sign in with your GitHub account. With your GitHub account, okay. Okay. Well, let's get, we started with HackMD. Let's 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 continue with HackMD. And uh, please, the note takers, uh, 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 please uh, uh, take notes in the in the HackMD uh, website. Uh, so uh, yes, as we said, the the ITF 107 meeting was cancelled, but uh, we actually managed to work uh, uh, quite well. So t t today um, is an interim meeting where we'll be discussing a lot of things from the ITF uh, 107. So this is an official uh, IETF uh, meeting, and by participating, uh, um, you acknowledge that you have read the note well. So please do read the note well if you have not done so. So by participating, you agree to follow the ITF process and policies. Uh, if you're aware of any contribution covered by patents or patent applications owned by you or controlled by your, your sponsor, you need to disclose that fact or do not participate in the discussion. So if you get aware of any of these, please come to, you know, say to the mailing list or come to the chairs after the meeting. Um, and uh, uh, yes, you need also to uh, obey to the code of conduct and uh, anti harassment procedures and all the good PCPs that are listed out here. So please uh, read them in, in detail if you have not done so yet. But you are any, any, in any case, you're bound by them. So anything that is said during today's meeting, um, in written, in saying, is considered an ITF contribution. Um, so as in any uh, meeting, the minutes are taken. So uh, we are, as a reminder, we're using the hackmd.io. So I pasted the link for our minutes for this time. Uh, as minute takers, uh, we can count uh, uh, on some of our regular minute takers. Uh, um, who would be the designated minute takers uh, for for this time? Uh, generally, we have Dominic, Arun, uh, Ivailo. Can we count on you guys for for this time as well? Sure. Yeah, Alex, I'm sorry, for some reason, I'm not able to connect to HackMD. Uh, still trying oh. to, if I, if I oh. do, I, I will help. You, you're, you're, oh, okay, you're, you're unable to log in or to connect? To connect right now. Page is unresponsive. Okay. Oh, okay. Maybe, what do you I'll, uh, maybe I'll restart uh, my web browser or something. So if you see me going and coming back, don't worry. I can also Olivier. take notes, Olivier speaking. Okay, thank you, Olivier. Thank you. It's really appreciated. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, the presence is locked. We'll be keeping uh, a blue sheet that will be recorded. Uh, and uh, the, the whole session is recorded. 
So please uh, um, take note of this. So I will be the Jabber scribe for this session. In case you need to uh, to say uh, anything, I will be on the Jabber. Um, also for for and uh, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, that's that's on the reminder. And uh, I'm giving the, uh, the 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 head the hand <coughs> over to my co-chair, Pascal. Um, thank you, Alex. So we get a, a longer answer on that than usual because it's not just a, a virtual interim as we do every other week, but it is actually the replacement for the ATF 107, as we said. So we'll, um, we, we have two pages of agenda. We'll go through the usual uh, agenda bashing, work of status. Um, Alex will tell us about the next in trend and uh, the new charter. Uh, we'll have a status of the draft, and then we'll uh, we'll go through the, the different drafts. So first will be the data models. That's Laurent, uh, Quark static context, and oops, I did not get the ball back. Um, then uh, Laura one tick box. Pascal, we cannot hear you. Oh, I cannot hear you. Can you speak louder? Uh, yes, I'm very close to the mic. Let me see if I can push it. Okay, so uh, I speak louder as well. So we, we'll go through the technologies for LoRa 1 and Sigfox, and then we'll discuss the, the case of PPP. We already discussed that as interim, but I want to confirm on this uh, group. Uh, then Dominic will uh, tell us about the, the remote hackathon, which replaces the uh, hackathon that should have taken place at the ITF. Uh, Dominic on the OAM. We've got room for Olivier on multicast. Uh, that's an item that we had at the last in trim, so we thought it was worth uh, having a better discussion with the group. And uh, that would be the uh, idea of business. Anything people want to add in change? I'm hearing nothing, so I guess the agenda was just bashed. And if I could scroll pages, that would be even better. So, as I presented at the uh, last interim, we have negotiated actually with uh, Suresh the, the milestones for the working group. You'll find that we have a single milestone for all the technology documents, and uh, probably we'll uh, split them as we go. Uh, we, we have a hope that uh, very soon, and we'll discuss that today, we can go for work group last call for the LoRa document. Um, so basically, when we, we know that, we'll probably ask uh, Eric to, to add some milestones about delivering um, one or two of the technology documents earlier than, than expected. So right now, the, the date is December 2020 to deliver to ISG. And uh, Alex, do you want to speak that slide? Yes, yes. So um, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Pascal, and thanks for everyone. So after uh, uh, four years, three years, four years of work, uh, we actually delivered everything that we uh, initially set for, and uh, we uh, got to our new charter, Charter 2.0, uh, new and improved. So basically, as we said from the last time, we have uh, the, uh, the, the we have expanded the charter items that we had before. So uh, first of all, it's perform chic maintenance, and that will include enabling chic mechanisms for upper layer protocols. Uh, produce uh, 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 the standard track documents for chic over foo, chic uh, IP six UDP over foo, and here we have uh, uh, at least two or three documents that will be presented today on that following this uh, charter item. Uh, we have the document for the generic data models. Uh, for the context, that will be really uh, that will also be a, a key uh, work item, and we have uh, the the work item on uh, uh, the um, uh, administration and maintenance, operation administration and maintenance. So in all of these uh, four points, we uh, when we have work so behind each of these work points and work items, we have uh, we have actually uh, actual documents. And we have teams that have already started working and uh, that have advanced really well on the work. So that's really great. And uh, this is really the way that we would like to see the, the work to continue. 
is uh, whenever there is new work that uh, comes to the working group is to have people uh, uh, you know submit uh, their contributions or there are some initial discussions and that we see that is, that uh, there is interest and that uh, there is support for for the work and that we actually know what we are going to be doing uh, so that's the point with multicast we had uh, an item on multicast um, uh, that we had that was uh, uh, initially in in the charter proposal uh, but when we actually needed to clarify with the ISG what exactly needs to go there, uh, well, we didn't have a document, we didn't have a um, clear idea of what we are, want to achieve, what the working group wants to achieve. So we decided to postpone that for the next charter. So what we would like to do is keep this way of working. So whenever we have a new uh, work to, to be done, you know, to have a draft to describe what's, what, what you would like to achieve, have the discussion, and then when we're fairly confident that we know, the working group is fairly confident that we actually know what's going there, then we can recharge them. There is no problem about that. But to, to have like a uh, work based on a uh, uh, clear objective. So that's for the charter and Pascal, back to you. Okay, so we said it once, uh, we'll say it twice. Congratulations to the uh, authors uh, of uh, 8724. And I believe that I actually won um, the game because we, we had a bet about the RFC number and I was the closest. But uh, somebody has to remember what the bet was about because I don't know what I win now and that's, that's sad. Uh, still, congratulations to, to the game. Great achievement. Hi Pascal, Arun here. Uh, couldn't hear you well. Excellent taking notes. Oh, so I, I, I moved my head closer, but then Carmen said I was breathing into it. So I removed AJC, but I just don't know what to do because normally this setup works fine. So I, I can switch microphone if you like. Let me try that. But I have a microphone which normally works fine. Okay, I just try to increase my volume and let's see how it goes. Uh, uh, so, Juan Carlos, uh, we actually changed. Okay, we actually changed and we are taking notes in hackmd.io. We will we'll paste. Yes? I, I tried to change the gain, I just need feedback to know what gain is correct. I heard it was too bad, I moved again to the max, I, I moved it closer to my mouth, and then I got from Carsten that I was breathing into the mic. So yes, I mean, th there is something wrong. So, so is it someone that does not hear me? Is it everybody? The most important thing is that you don't breathe into the microphone. And the second mo most important thing is that you switch off any automatic gain control, because if you get noises like the crackling from your, your broken cable, um, or of the breathing in your microphone, then the AGC will uh, turn you back to quiet. So switch off AGC. Last you spoke, we could hear you well, Pascal. Well, I'm using a dynamics compressor on WebEx, so I don't care who's loud and who's quiet. So, so um, Juan Carlos, you said you hear me well, or you don't hear me well? You, now it's okay, Pascal. At least for me. Okay. So, you know, normally I put I put it pretty much in this situation, but then somebody said you could not hear me. So it's okay. If if it looks okay, let me continue. So I was saying, Suresh, many many thanks for all your help. So he's not there, but uh, we should have had Suresh at the NCF, and and uh, we had a plan to 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 make a party for him and thank him for all the great work he did. With this group and this group and all the other groups at uh, the interior, so you know, a remote thank to Suresh, and a big welcome to Eric. Uh, welcome to this group and welcome to the area. So very glad to have you with us. Clap, clap, clap. Uh, virtual claps as well because nobody's here to clap with hands. So. Yes. Let's get to oh. well, welcome, Eric. We're very happy to have you on board, and we are sure we'll. Uh, We'll achieve even, you know, we'll, we'll continue our great work under your supervision as well. Let's cross fingers. 
No, I'm sure. <laughs> but it's more than that. Um, so status of our documents. So we have uh, five active uh, workup documents. So the, the, they will all be presented today, but for the NBIOT. So maybe, uh, Anna, if you can give us just now a quick status on, on NBIOT. And the IoT, we have divided um, the solution in four use cases, and we are planning. We are just trying to to finish the configuration parameters for each use case, and we are planning to do, submit a new version um, for the end of June. Uh, so it's going forward, and and I we think Edgar and me that for the end of the year, it will be in last call. Okay. Thank you very much, Anna. So we look forward to for seeing this draft. It seems from, from uh, these four use cases that it's like uh, four documents in one, so that can explain why uh, it takes longer to actually um, achieve this, this work. So many, many thanks, Anna. So the other four drafts will be presented today, so I don't spend too much time on it. Uh, in particular, you see that we, we have still uh, three uh, discusses uh, attached to the co-op draft, which is reviewed by the ASG. And we have uh, three uh, documents, three documents. One of them uh, is still very debated whether we do want or not to have this registry for the command and control uh, rules in the check. So right now, it's not clear. So this document won't be discussed today. It's just there if, if people want to, to, to use a, to have a NR registry, we'll just need to revise this draft. For the time being, I just let it be. Um, and uh, Dominique will present the OAM, and then we'll discuss a little bit of the future of the PPP draft. So all this will be covered uh, later today. And uh, Alex, yours? Yes, thank you very much, Pascal. And uh, we actually managed to get your to distract you so that you forget what you actually got because you correct you correctly uh, guessed the RFC number of ship uh, and you are actually you you had one round of beer from every one of the participants but uh, hopefully we'll be able to deliver this on the next ITF um, and until then uh, so I, we wanted so with Pascal we did this uh, this overview of the working group for that that's been happening in the past four years and so we get, uh, so we met in uh, 10 ITFs, we had nine hackathons and around 50 interim meetings. So this is one really important point is that a lot of the work actually was done uh, also in the between the ITFs and uh, the interims are a really important part and even more in, in, in the current uh, situation. Um, so we would like to resume our regular meetings with the same, uh, uh, as we had before, so we would like to propose uh, the meetings to be on the same time slot as in the past. So every two weeks, uh, uh, in um, the Wednesday, 4 p.m. 5 p.m. Uh, Central European Standard Time, um, and uh, the the proposed dates are made. You see the dates. So it's it's starting three weeks from now. Um, so if you uh, if you have any problems any troubles with this uh, uh, with these uh, dates please uh, say so in the chat or or send an email and uh, you know we have uh, probably by by the end of the week and in the meantime we'll be scheduling these uh, these meetings uh, so you know if there are huge uh, new collisions or you know troubles with these dates please do say so. Alex, if, yes. I, if, if I may yes. say, um, because Eric is, is new with us, we also have been heavy users of the rooms that the IETF uh, lets us use in between meetings, you know, those um, off the meeting rooms, like, uh, what do they, do they call this? Like, well, non-regular meeting rooms that we can book. We had a number of design sessions for Chic in those rooms. So we really appreciate that the ASG uh, makes those rooms available to people. It has been very useful to us. Bye -bye. Okay, you mean the side meetings, right? Side meetings, that was the term I was looking for. So yes, side meeting rooms yeah. were very, very efficient and, and useful for us. Thank you.
So I think we're through. That was the last the last slide of the introduction. So I'll move to the next section. And Anna, I will give you the ball. Make you presenter. Just tell me if you have trouble switching slides, and I would. Is that is Laurent that will present data model? It's Laurent. Yes, his name is Laurent and Anna, but I'm alone in Anna. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Because you're you're very very far. Okay, so I will present uh, the young uh, chic, uh, the young data model for chic, and so it's the job we have done uh, now and I. And uh, so, um, so the current version is uh, version two, and uh, you can have access to either the draft or the young model on the GitHub at this uh, URL. And uh, we are now working on the version of 28th of February. So what has changed in in the model, or what from the discussion from previous? Uh, uh, presentation is that now this model focus only on young and don't include some tricks we can have for core conf so as to have a very uh, clear and uh, young model and then of course we and of course we have in mind also what we can do with core conf to optimize things but that's not uh, the goal of this uh, model is just to define things in young so normally it will be only one uh, file, but currently for simplicity, for it's easier to develop, at least for, for us, it has been split in two parts. One file is chic ID, and here you have the definition of all the types and identifiers that are used in chic. So for example, it's uh, the fill ID definition or the identifier for chic fill ID, matching operator, etc., etc. And we have another file that is called chic, and this one defies the uh, context for compression and fragmentation. So this is for our development, and when we will agree on all the values, then we will merge it on a single file. So here is uh, an example of uh, chic ID. So it's a very huge uh, file that describes all the parameters we can find in um, in, in chic. So here I just give you an example for the fill ID, but you can have the same thing for matching operator, CDA, and fragmentation parameters. So what we have, we have we use an identity that can be viewed like a new URL that will define uh, uniquely a field. So we have this base identity, identity, and then we derive all the fields from we can find in chic from this basic identity. And so we have, for example, a feed ID for uh, IPv6 version, for traffic class, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when we have, once we have defined feed, uh, these things, we create a class that is called feed ID type, and will base on this ID, my main identity. And so in the rest of the model, when we want to define uh, uh, feed ID, then we will use the, this type. So what has changed? since uh, the previous uh, version, is that we go a little bit deeper. So for example, here we have a, a traffic class identifier, but it can be also divided in two parts. So to have access, if we want more uh, precision, into the diff serve or the ECN class. So this uh, is a splitting. And we can do also the same splitting in for, uh, for co-op. For example, for code, code can be cut in two classes, for example, two parts, one for class and the other for, for details. So this can be useful, for example, if we just want to get, uh, for example, we need to know that it's a for something, so we can just send a for and we don't have to, to send the same thing. So maybe it has an interest for uh, co-op field compression. So here, we have this, uh, so it's a list of all the fields we have in, uh, we have defined for compression. So as I say, we have class traffic class that has been defined in subclasses, 
same thing for code. And we have also something that has been added for uh, co-op, that is end option, which is not really an option, but it's a fixed value that we can find in, uh, in the header. So for co-op, I have some, uh, some question of the group on how to, to do it. So Karsten has proposed, for example, to reserve the whole option space to put in, uh, in Young. So that could be a good way because if you create a new option, then we don't have to redefine uh, something new for, for Chic. But it can also lead to something very huge. If we take all the space for options, then we, we have 16 bits that are reserved, or uh, 65, 555 value that are reserved. And maybe we can do it, just reserve it for the value between 0 and 255. So currently it's not done, but it's something we, we can add. Same thing for the end option. It's something that is not an option, but can, is also added to uh, the identifier for, for Chic. Can, can, excuse me, can you explain how the uh, payload marker, which I think you're talking about, yeah. mm. uh, correlates to the option number space? Because option numbers are relative numbers relative to the previous option and have very variable length coding, uh, mm. while the, the payload marker really is always this, this thing. So the, the difference is that, in fact, in Chic, we don't use the delta encoding. We go back to the option number to do uh, the identifying, identification. So we have a stable number. Yes, so, so if you already do this decoding, then you simply don't see those payload markers. And then uh, it's not an option. It, yes, it's, it's, it's a possible to, it's a possibility not to, to have it. OpenSheek is using it, but I know that some other implementations are not using it. So maybe it's not necessary for, for compression. Well, we, we could always go ahead and allocate that particular number to an option. So that, that's very weird. Yeah, OK. So we have to take care of this, OK? So we cannot put it in the same space. Please don't. OK. And for the, uh, if we reserve some value, do you agree that only the ITF review can be necessary, or we have to go to more larger space? It depends on the application. Uh, th there are some, some option numbers in the 10,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Yeah. I, just confusing two things. Mm. So it, yeah, maybe you can just uh, do an efficient encoding for zero to three thousand, and and do something inefficient for everything else. That might work. Okay. So and I have another problem. If we do that, is that I don't know in in Young how to create space without naming everything. So it means that in the young model, we may have 300 uh, definition of uh, rules like this. So it can, uh, 3,000 uh, uh, definition of rule like this, which can be very, very huge. And that may be very the trick to do it in young, but I didn't see it. OK, so. For the chic uh, model by itself, there is few changing since uh, the last version. So the main changing is that we add a version number in the rule, and maybe it's quite useful, for example, for a device to check if the core has the same uh, rule version. So right now it's just uh, a value, and it's not used to make something uh, hierarchical and have in a rule several ver several versions. It's just to ident identify rule and see if both uh, ends agree on, on the number. We have also changed the target values. So it was a complex structure before. And now 
what we did is a union of two types is binary and string. And this way we can code every any value in Young that can be either represented as a number or a bit string or as a string. So this way it's quite optimal and it's a nice way to do things and there is no limitation at all uh, for that. So for example, if you have URL of element of an URL, so it, uh, we can put anything we want in it. The other thing uh, is that we have included all the value, for example, for fragmentation. So we took all the regular things that is in the RFC, and we put also the value that we find in Annex D. And we have this, uh, the definition for icon error. So two behavior that are defined in, in the RFC. The first one is act behavior. It means when the receiver or the reassembler has to send an acknowledgement. So we have three choices, it's after all zero, after all one, or when he wants. So at a, a, any time, the layer two will decide. And we have also another part that currently is a view as a Boolean, which say tile in all one. We have two behaviors that are compatible each other, but the sender may decide just to send uh, SCS in uh, the all one, or can send a tile on the RCS. So here it's a way to describe what we can do. So currently it's true or false, but we will move to something that is yes, no, or optional. So yes, it means that the sender has to put a tile in all one. No, it doesn't have to do it, or optional. He do what he wants, and the receiver will be able to, uh, to determine if there is data or not. And it's the standard alloy. So, to conclude, uh, I think we have something right now that is quite stable, but have to be improved in terms of description, but uh, we think that it's quite good for, for young. So, now we, we have to see if uh, we can go to uh, young, doc young Doctor Review. And, uh, of course, what we have to do also is to put more uh, the description into the young model to explain without any ambiguity what are all these fields. Okay, so that's for me. Question? I have a question. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I just read in the document that you can have a rule ID of length zero, so with no rule ID. Um, and you said this can be used for the default rule. Can you explain how you plan on using that, and especially how do you transmit such a rule packet that is processed by such a rule over the air if you have a zero length rule ID? So, as uh, from the young, spe young model speaking or for chick speaking? Well, I thought this young model described chick. Yeah. So I tried to change the site, but I cannot. Maybe uh, someone uh, remove me as a presenter. Okay. Uh, so here, when you describe a rule, you put rule ID and rule length. So if you want to send a rule ID, if you want to describe a, a rule from zero length, then you put zero in this uh, rule length. And then it's uh, defined in the young model. So the rule zero or the, zero, the length zero can be used to be a, a view as an implicit root. For example, you have a device that is not chic, so we'll send data and it goes to a core chic decompressor and then it just uh, has one rule that describes how to process the information. Okay, so how do you know? It's because this device never use, uses chic? If you have a zero length rule, you can have only one rule and 
the value is never sent on the air. Right, but then if you have such a rule, then you can't have any other one. Yeah. Because when you receive a, a package, you don't know which one it belongs okay. to. Okay. So it's what, what we call in the, at the beginning the legacy model to bring okay. the no, non chic uh, device to chic. So it's not the, well, you, you called it the default rule rule and it's probably the mm. ubiquitous rule the only one the only yeah. rule. but where okay. is it in which document in the young model model in the draft in the draft a young draft okay i will check okay i'll send you a pointer mm. thank you okay um any more questions can i move to the next slide this is so this time I guess Anna the CDU. This time is me. Well, just one quick quick one. Uh, do you have the fragmentation padding bit values in the young model as well? Mm, no, I don't think so. What do you mean the bit uh, the pattern the value, for padding? The value, yeah, the value that you use for padding. No, but it can be added. Okay, we need to think about it. I think we need it. It's in Linux D? I think so. Need to check. <laughs> yes, it is in Linux D, I think. Yeah. Okay. And the body tools, I guess. Can you check? Did you hear me? Yes, it's okay. Okay. Yes, yes, and now you can okay. go ahead. I go for round on with co-op, static context header compression. Uh, we want to make the status of this draft um we are almost done not not at, at all but we have uh, seven yes and three objections uh we need three more just to pass or no objection to pass uh we want to thank everybody that has read this draft and i'm going to show the three major discussions that we need to see or to agree about what we want to answer put in the draft so um, the first point is the co-op options. Um, I think uh, there is a confusion between bidirectional and unidirectional description and bidirectional options in co-op. Um, uh, the second point of this input is uh, what will happen with the options that are not described in the draft. So for the first part, um, the confusion is that uh, uh, co-op options are bidirectional by nature, and when we are doing compression, sometimes we are describing the option as unidirectional. But this this is because chic. Uh, when we make compression, we look for the target value and how we can compress it with matching operator and decompress it with the CDA. So when the value that is sent in one sense is different from the other sense, we are describing the field twice, one for up down and one for down node. Uh, and that's why it's only unidirectional. But this doesn't mean that we are changing the co-op option. We are only changing the description of because of the value. Um, so um, the thing is to review again uh, all the options uh, to see if we are correct and saying that they are bidirectional, but the description could be unidirectional. Uh, I need to answer to Alexi. Uh, and the second point of this uh, discussion is about what happened 
with the options that we have not described in the draft. So we are planning to add a description in section five for the generic uh, compression of an option. Uh, Co-op options are described in the TLB uh, format, so type land value. And when we apply a check process, a type becomes a fill ID. The land becomes uh, said in section 7.4 of RFC 8724, uh, how to compress the land of this field. And the value becomes the target value. When the land is uh, fixed, uh, we are sending the compressed residue value. And when the length of this option is variable, we send the size of the compression residue plus the compression residue value. Uh, so we need to explain this because even if we don't if we don't explain all the options, we can compress any option with this uh, with this format. Uh, so I don't know if there are some questions here or it's clear that we we want to we can compress with check any options and the describing this in section five we will resolve uh, this question okay. the second point is about uh, Context initialization in the architecture. This is from Magnus Van Starlen um, review. Um, because uh, in section two of draft, we show that we can make a quad compression in different stacks. And in the first point, we have uh, uh, application to application. So we only compress quad without compressing all the stacks. So his his problem or his, his question here is to to know where we are going to do this context initialization because normally when we compress on the stack here in the slide when you compress on the slide the context initialization is done in layer two because chic is done here in between layer three and layer two but what will happen when we are doing uh, only co web compression? without all the stack. So um, we have a check between layer seven or the application co-op and layer four or UDP or perhaps DTL, I don't know, something in the middle. So in open layers. Uh, so, okay, uh, as there is no, nothing already done about context initialization, nowhere, neither in AD, AD724, neither here, uh, I as I tell him that for the moment it was out of the scope of the the document to explain exactly how to make context initialization, but uh, we can add um, a note saying that when this part of the architecture will be done, we have to take care about how to uh, make the the negotiation the context initialization when we are only compression layer, layer seven or, or co-op only, and uh, the compression is done end to end between two applications. Uh, is, are you agree with this or do you think that context initialization or that we need to explain how it is done? So it's long, uh, so I'm going for, but I give my opinion on, on it. It's, but it's something that is more generic than co-op. It's something that has to be tackled by the working groups and not only for co-op. Uh, so I put... Yes, definitely. I, I, I second. Yeah. Sorry. 
I so I agree. Uh, I agree with what uh, Laurent just said that we need uh, uh, a way to to have this in in, in a generic way. The context and conversation. So I leave this as a note saying that it's out of the scope, but that we need to take care when we will do that. I mean, when we built the data model, there were two main reasons in my mind. One of them was to enable the writing of the technology documents so they would know what to, to place in the profile. And the other one was uh, once we have a data model, um, then we can start distributing the context um, and to both parties, in particular in the infrastructure, being able to, to prepare the, the gateway side to, to talk to a new device, to install the, the right state in the gateway to, to be able to, un to, to uncompress the shape compress packets from this new device. So I guess and we when we write it. this document, I mean, we'll have to, to have a section on, on this context initialization. It's part of it. Yes, so um, I completely agree with, uh, with Pascal. So this also brings the importance of the, the previous presentation is to say, okay, well, we need to get uh, the, I mean, it seems to me to, to that the work can be investing really well. So uh, as the moment that we have the data model, then we can have everything else that comes out of it directly. Okay, so um, do you have point? anything? Yes. yes, okay, please continue. My third point is about the security section. So um, there are many inputs about uh, that we need to increase and, and put really what uh, the relevant considerations for security. Um, uh, I sent a mail some time ago to the mailing list. I didn't receive any input. Uh, here is the text, the new text we are proposing to put uh, now in section nine. Uh, we are aligning to the RFC 8744, 24, sorry, um, security part. Uh, we are not changing the consideration of OSCOR. Um, we don't, we are not reducing or increasing any security level because we are only doing compression. Uh, and I also add uh, that uh, when there is a corrupted header, we have integrity chic uh, in chic, enable to to know uh, when we have to drop a compressed packet that is not correct. Uh, well, Anna, if I can yes. interrupt, uh, to my knowledge, we have integrity checking on the fragmentation, not on the compression. Yes. When you you wrote a uh, chic header compression scheme uses an integrity check to verify the reconstructed headers. I'm not sure which integrity check you're talking about. I know that we have one in the fragmentation, but fragmentation is not always used. Is that something else that you are describing? No. Okay, so that should be reworded a little bit, probably. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about the last one on your slide as well. You say if we have variable length header fields, if a corrupted packet comes to the decompressor, which reconstructs uh, with a length that is different from that in the original header, then the error will be detected and the packet be dropped. I'm curious yeah. how you do that because how do you know the the length of the head of the header in the original packet? If you knew that, then you would not need to send it. 
So how can you compare the reconstructed length with the length of the original because packet? The variable length I'm sending the size the size of the residue and not the size of the field. So if an attacker and a corrupt six cents uh, uh, an incorrect length of the residue, I will not be able to decompress this packet because it's the length of the residue and not the length of the variable field. Are you talking about things like TLB points or, no. or a fixed size field? No, variable, uh, when we send a variable length residue. Yeah. Okay, variable length residue yeah. for a fixed yeah. size field. Hmm. Yeah, so, variable length residue. So, for example, if you say my, because we have always this uh, zip explosion, and people, when they read it, they think about the uh, zip uh, explosion, I don't remember. It's called, but you say I have uh, 10,000 of zeros, and then when you reconstruct things, then you put 10,000 of the zeros, and then you send something very, very huge. In fact, mm -hmm. here is the opposite: is what we are sending is the length of what we send, not the length of what we cut. So if you put a very high value, then you have to send data, the same amount of data, to be believed by the receiver. It's not an attack. Okay. So it's already said in uh, uh, RFC 8724, I think, that it's the place where we are using variable length residues. So, uh, but uh, as we say, this section is very hard to write because we don't put new things compared to the basic uh, chic uh, compression. We just apply it to, to co-op. So we don't see what we have to, what we can put in more details about uh, attacks or security uh, problems due to to shake. So we are looking for really the inputs you can you can give us because hmm. we are really not a security person. Um, just an answer. Have you um, has anything been done in the uh, in order to ensure that the score layer can actually detect changes in the in the compression? Because that's been an open issue, and I didn't see anything to address that so far. No, but maybe we can discuss of it. So the um the the con I guess we lost you. Chris, and you're muted. Oh. You muted yourself again. <laughs> Um, the concern was that um, it, it says here that end-to-end -end authentication um, may detect such a corruption, um, but as I understand, if the sender and the receiver disagree about the com about the compression that is used about in, in for the for the compressed method, that might not show up in the checks, and it would not, and nothing about the nothing about the compression is fed into the authenticated data. So there is a proposal on, the, I've sent a proposal back a year ago or so um, that's also filed in a GitHub issue, but um, I think we should we should check again whether there is something in there now okay. or how this could be, how this could be addressed without kind of putting things far, back too far. Okay. I'll follow up on the mailing list. Okay, thank you. Because we are getting out of, uh, of time for this section. Okay, that's my last, uh, I think it's my last one. Oh, perfect, thank you. So I, I need to answer to all the reviewers and I need to uh, 
um, to submit a new version. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, uh, I, I just want to add something because I I didn't have time to send it into the Lake Working Group, but uh, using uh, co-op compression, it's quite uh, efficient for uh, ad hoc protocol. So with only one rule, you can compress uh, co-op header in two bytes, and it works with uh, regular uh, IO co-op uh, implementation. Thank you, Laurent. I guess we will move on to the end of the document. So who is presenting? Uh, is it Olivier? Valio? Who, who is presenting? Yes, for the last one, it's me. Me being Olivier. I, yes, yes, I'm sorry. So while, while, while Olivier is, is starting, uh, just thing for Christian, he used the plus Q on, on the chat. So in case you would like to ask questions or you would like to you know to get the mic, please do a plus Q on the chat and you know it's like a virtual Q. And if you want to get removed, you, you type a minus Q. This way, you know, we can uh we can give you the, the word when it's when it's time. But for the moment it's been doing really well, uh, you know, the way we're doing it. And in case there are several people that want to talk to talk, then use the pl the plus Q uh, uh the, the plus Q uh, in the chat. Does Q plus work as well? Um, well, our with Pascal, our interpreter works. That doesn't seem to block. So plus Q or Q plus. Works it's a symmetric well. operator. <laughs> yes. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> so if you like, you do plus Q or Q plus or Q plus plus. So sometimes it's a plus. It's for what? Okay. So if you want, so. Let's continue as we go, and if in case we 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 need several people to talk in the same time, please please you know cue yourself with plus cue. So thank you. Uh, sorry for that. And Olivia, you can please go ahead with the presentation. Okay. So here is the um, chick of our law one update. Um, we will resume the change from the last ATS we had in. Uh, Singapore, uh, then some technical discussion and the next step. So what happened? We published three drafts, uh, draft five, six, and seven. Um, five was quite big, but six and seven was many small changes. Um, thank you all that we get a lot of feedback, uh, which helped to do that. So in change uh, five, um, in draft five, sorry, we added the ID proposition on how to compute the, um, the ID. A lot of edits uh, following thanks to Dominic reviews. So really thank you, Dominic. Uh, we updated the acknowledgments with all the um, all the feedback I got. Maybe there was some. Um, some feedback before I was involved in the document. So if you're not listed in here or you think somebody should be listed in here, please tell us. Um, and we change um, the acknowledgement behavior from the end of each window to optional uh, for clean fragmentation. So it can be at the end of each window or at the end of the fragmentation session. Uh, it has been requested by Aaron. And there was no reason to limit it. We just explain um, what is good in each case in the document. In draft number six, uh, uh, we refined the ID collision paragraph, but added. Um, we updated security explanation. Um, we improved the chic acknowledgement behavior we added in draft five. Um, so it's, it was more easy to understand. Uh, at least we thought at the time. Um, we fixed an RFC compilation issue and clarified the last title behavior, the, the last tile, sorry. So we clarified that the last tile can be in the, um, the all one or in the penultimized uh, tile. 
Um, oh, there is. Okay, the draft seven is missing. I don't know why. Uh, let's say it. Um, so in draft seven, we we change again the chick uh, act behavior chapter. Um, we restart it from scratch because it was not really easy to understand at all. So it has been done again, and there was maybe two typo fixed. Uh, so the technical discussion is about the um, EID. It's derived from the DAVUI and the LoRaWAN APS key. For those who don't know DAVUI in LoRaWAN context, it's the unique identifier of the device. And the APS key is the key derived um, for each session. So by using it, we can ensure that the EID can change over time, as requested by the ITS guidelines about the EID. Um, it can be renewed, uh, like I say, by issuing a new join. Uh, this, the way we we issue a new join is left to the implementation, and uh, this way has been approved by the Law Alliance. So there is no issue at using the DFUI or the Law API key for that. So. Now that uh, the document has been quite stable since draft five, we only did some minor typo and better explanations. Uh, we think that it should be the, um, ready for the last call, the working group last call, so it has to be discussed with you. Um, and that's all. So I mean, if if you guys think that uh, you're ready and uh, considering the progress and the discussion that I've seen on the interim, I don't think that we should delay this last call. So if there is no position today and we confirm that on the mailing list, then uh, well, we'll post for work of last call. Maybe three weeks to to do the work of last call, so we can uh, complete it uh, by before the next interim. That sound right? To me, yes. I'm hearing nothing apart from yes. So, okay. So we'll we'll um, we'll issue a, a workup last call um, with a three weeks uh, review time. So asking you guys to, to actually look at this document. It is the first technology document that we will uh, issue, which means that it will be kind of a reference for the the, the type of content and uh, the layout uh, of the technology document for SHIC. So it's very important that the first document is done right, and uh, so the more documents, the more reviews we get, uh, the better for this document. So please uh, consider when we issue the last call, apply to the last call mail and provide your comments. Many thanks in advance. And with this, I guess we'll move on. Any question on the draft? Okay, so let's Thank you. And uh, one Carlos, I guess, you. One Carlos. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So thanks for Pascal. Yes, I want to give a, an update about the the draft uh, shake over shake box. Let me see if I can move the slides here. Yes, perfect. So. Uh, on the status, uh, we haven't done any any revision because we were uh, relying on 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 testing some parameters and some changes at the hackathon in Vancouver, which of course got cancelled together with the with the meeting. Uh, since then, we've been working on uh, on the new uh, remote setup to continue advancing. It's been a little challenging just to make sure that we get the equipment uh, in place. Uh, uh, recuperating equipment from labs and stuff, it was a challenge. But uh, so far, it seems like uh, we're getting back on track. Uh, just as a reminder, the last uh, draft updates uh, were about adding uh, parameters for the icon error uh, data fragmentation and integrity mode. Uh, and also, we tested the, the parameters on, on the University of Chile's uh, size sheet implementation 
uh, notably to send uh, text files uh, about 53 bytes and small uh, images, like 356. Uh, we're still relying on the architecture that uh, is based on the on the tutorial by uh, Marco Lepisto from uh, Google Cloud. So the idea is to to implement uh, the PyChic client on uh, on a Pycom uh, at the device side and on a Google uh, function on the on the cloud side. Uh, of course, connecting back to the to the Sigfox uh, cloud. The architecture, again, as a reminder uh, of the software that uh, the guys at the University of Chile are, are developing, is meant to be uh, is meant to be unique for both uh, Sigfox and LoRaWAN. So there's a common fragmenter and parser uh, message. Uh, then there's also a Sig session uh, engine. And then below there are specific functions for uh, either Sigfox or LoRaWAN. Right now, of course, the the one we are working on is the profile for Sigfox, but the idea is to make it uh, generic and also test uh, for interoperability in the, in the future. So for the next steps, uh, of course, we want to uh, now make the updates uh, required to match the terminology of RFC 8724 now, now that it's uh, published, which also, by the way, got us a little uh, stop because we were doing the last RFC editing changes in RFC uh, 8724 to get it out. But now that that is done, uh, we can get back on track for, for this one. Uh, the idea, again, to use the sequence numbering to, to optimize Shikak transmissions, uh, for instance, the old one fragment. Uh, fine-tuned timers, uh, header fields, etc., and also the, for the interoperability test, uh, we have already uh, made a proposal to do uh, an interop, interop test at the hackathon in, in Vancouver. Um, right now, I guess the question mark is whether we should uh, plan for something in Madrid, Bangkok, uh, which are pretty much up in the air, or we sh if we should start thinking about doing something uh, virtual and remote. Uh, but I guess I, I'll leave that uh, discussion for the hackathon presentation that is upcoming from Dominic. So are there any questions? I have one, one Carlos. Um, I understand that the document is not yet fully ready, and anyway, we are going to do the LoRa document first. But um, do you have a, a clear idea on when you're ready for Waco Plus Four? We were planning to have it for, for summer. I, I guess you, you, you asked for the, uh, when working group last call. It's hard for me yes, to hear when on the board. It's still ready to ask us. Yes, yeah, so so hopefully uh, in, in the summer when we can we can have it. Once we have the setup, uh, it should be straightforward to to get the the information on the draft and then ask for a working group last one. Because we will be changing the milestones um, for Laura, so maybe we can also add a specific milestone to Sigfox. So if the work group last call is in summer, then I guess we could we could say something like. Send to ISG in September. In in which month did you say, sorry? September uh, nine. September. September, yes. Yeah. For well, ISG, right? I mean, past work group last call. Yes. Okay, we will we'll have a milestone, uh, Eric. So don't be surprised if you get two milestones. One milestone will be uh, less than two months from now. It's going to be the LoRa document to ISG and so we're in April so somewhere in like early June and uh, early September we'll have the Sigfox document and then in December we have uh, NBIOT I guess. This so, would be cool thank you Pascal. And uh, with this we are going to move to thank you very much Juan Carlos. And we're going to move to PPP and PPP being me. <coughs> so this is uh, still a personal submission. We've discussed already at the interim, but for those of you who are not at the interim, 
we have a document which is a bit borderline for uh, this working group, which is shake over PPP. And the reason for defining shake compression over PPP um, is as soon as you have PPP, then obviously you get serial links, you know, all the usual phone, uh, mobile phone, uh, serial cable, RS, uh, whatever. Uh, you also get uh, XG, uh, like if you use a standard data, the phone. You, since there is Ethernet, uh, PPP over Ethernet, you, uh, as soon as you have shake over PPP, you've got shake over Ethernet. And uh, since there is a Wi-Fi um, emulated Ethernet, you also have Wi-Fi. So it seems that um, enabling shake over PPP opens a broad range of applications on a broad range of uh, networks. So it looks like you know a simple enabler. So we already have RFC 5172, which explains how you can do other modes of compression. There is a mode zero, mode one. So we'll be basically doing a mode two. And uh, so you, you just ignore in this uh, little header, in the IPCP, uh, I'm doing mode two, which is check. And then you can provide data and the idea is uh, as data, we provide the URL where um, the, the, the expression of the data model for compressing this particular device is uh, exposed to, to the server side, can find the URL, and from the URL, learn the context, set up the context that is needed for this particular device. That's how we see it. Uh, obviously, if, if you have another idea, uh, it's still time to, to tell, tell me. My intention is to uh, actually uh, republish this draft as uh, a NIMP area document as soon as they have uh, enough, and, and Ron Carlos is there to, to see it, enough support for uh, doing this work. If Sheik is saying, yes, it's something we want, it's LP1, then um, basically we get enough, get enough support to go and progress this work. Uh, since it's PPP, it's not really scope for us. So this area looks, uh, as we said in earlier meetings, uh, into meetings, uh, this area seems to be the, the right one. Um, so discussion for this draft and question to the group. Oh, I said six man, I meant uh, in area. Um, do we um, do we need more in this draft? I mean, do we need a section like? Why is this needed? Uh, what kind of applications do we uh, think will uh, require chic? We could, could have a section like that if people want more motivation, and maybe Interior will ask for that. So if, if you have hints and about applicability statements, then I'm interested. Uh, and the co-author would be welcome, by the way. Um, then publish at Interior or Six Man, but it seems to me that Interior is better. And if there is anything else in this document that people would like to see, and I see that Diego is queuing up. Yes, I have a question. May I write now, Ben, better? Okay. Um, do you have some uh, some initial implementation we can work with, or just this is only no. first ideas about it? Actually, it's, it's uh, more, more of an open question because part of the biggest piece, I mean, it's very simple to change a one into a two in the, the compression uh, descriptor in, in the PPP compression uh, option. It, it, it's more difficult to provide the URL where the data model is being expressed because we still don't have a data model. <laughs> so uh, clearly we have a dependency on the data model document and once we, we can uh, effectively provide the binary of, uh, of the, the, all the rules for a particular device, then we can test this uh, document. Right now, it's, it's hung, quote unquote, because we, we are missing, you know, the, the, the representation of the model. And I see that Anna is queuing up. Uh, uh, yes, Anna, but I read your document and I have some questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is, uh, are you planning to add an NCP negotiation for all the context validation profiles and so forth? I was not. Um, I was under the idea that 
we are operating in a world where the capabilities would be all there on the gateway. And I do not have the impression that the capabilities were so varied that we would need to negotiate capability. Um, was I wrong? Do you think that? No, you no, no, I'm just asking if it's possible to make something like that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Say again. I, I could not hear you, Ada, so I'm sorry, we could even. Yeah, I just want to know if we, we can negotiate some things, some parameters there. So we can add an NCP and make it more dynamic and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, if there, there, there are features which we could want to not implement, then we would need to negotiate. It seems to me a lot more complicated to have code to negotiate capabilities than to just implement the capabilities. Um, basically, you know, we're talking about full-fledged gateways here. So do you foresee that there are capabilities? Um, yeah, it's, we, I, I don't see that we need uh, to negotiate capabilities. On the other hand, I see that we might want to provide a profile for PPP. Yeah. That's um, why I have profiles and configuration. The LoRa, the LoRa one. In, if we take this path, then we better keep the document in, in LP1 because we are the place where we understand what a profile is. And Interior would be in trouble. If, if the most, most important focus of this document is to provide a profile for, uh, in the, I would say, high speed links and high capacity devices, so basically push all the knobs to maximum, um, then, then I, I, I would not try to publish at Sysman or Interior. I would, I would continue at, at LP1. What do people think? On, on, on that point, um, so we, uh, uh, of course, you can uh, keep the work here at, in LP1, and uh, I'll be chairing the, the, the work uh, on, on this uh, particular item. Then the point would be also um, how would the, the, the link with um, Interia would happen or with the six man about the, you know, the registration of the new number in PPP and, uh, you know, the necessary changes that will be there. So can we do the work here and then have like a liaison or, or you know, at some point ping people uh, from the PPP world? Um, maybe that will be a, a faster way to do. Or, you know, I mean, I think that the options are, at least from my personal perspective, it, the, it makes sense both ways. Eric, would you have a, a major? I, I don't think there, no problem. This document, we I mean, we need to 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 decide a little bit more on this. But Interia seems really the place to go, though. Because there are two things now, Eric. Uh, so maybe we could circulate it to Interia. But what we are just discussing right now is the fact that. Uh, we might be missing a section on profiling check for, I would say, high-speed networks, high-capacity devices. Uh, just like, you know, the LP1 document, which is a technology document, or the Sigfox document, they profile check. They give you uh, values you can use and methods that you can use out of all the paraphernalia of methods that the uh, RSC 8724 uh, actually provides. And so if most of this document is chic profiling, you see that the interior people will have a hard time figure if we have all the right profile elements and if we have the right values for them. Um, if okay, the then you... You would suggest that we extend the charter to cover PPP as well. 
Okay, that works for me. Or we do it by AD sponsor, which I would not mind. I mean, basically, the only thing that, that would be off our charter is the actual link on which we apply it, right? Correct. Uh, That's so correct. If we get an AD sponsor to, to just guarantee that we are doing okay, at the end of the day, it always it's always the ISG, right? One way or another. Either the ISG says, yeah, yeah, and PPP or if it's AD sponsor, it can be a proposed standard, so that's not a problem on this. Um, maybe Pascal and Axel, we should talk on this, uh, and not, uh, the three of us to see what's better, and then come back to the working group and see, hey, that's what we, pro we are proposing. Okay, but I, I see that. Uh, but I honestly, I, I'm, I'm open to to either extend the charter or do a sponsor. Okay. okay so because you're right, it's interest, but maybe not the best. Hmm. Yeah, that works for me. We are taking the path of actually saying, hey, uh, we need to put uh, at least one new section um, of profiling a chic for high speed links. And if we do that, then that makes this document a chic, a LP1 document. And now it's about you know which is the path through ASG uh, through either a sponsor or uh, and the chairs and AD will take that offline. Mm -hmm. The main decision for this working group is probably that we keep the document at home, which is fine. Mm -hmm. And as author now chart off, uh, uh, I can use a co-author. It will prove, of course, the interest in working on this. And getting another co-authors and more reviews will prove that there is interest behind this document. It's always very important. Yeah, and that's, that's why I, I said applicability statement, because uh, there are actually some, some uh, domains of application. We are talking about just a compression mechanism. Mm. We are not talking about a particular protocol. We are just enabling compression. So the, the question is really, do we see places where this particular compression uh, has specific advantages? And the answer is yes. It's just that nobody mm -hmm. wrote it, but, but I know some applications. Mm -hmm. so yes, I could have an applicability statement which would actually uh, go in your direction, Eric. Um, so I'm, I'm ready to yeah, Pascal, uh, thank, thanks, thanks a lot for the um, for, for the presentation. The time is running; is it's, we are a little bit behind the, the schedule now. So um, yes, thanks for submitting the, the draft, and thanks Eric for the for the input. And uh, it will be really exciting to see this draft uh, advancing. And uh, we already know that it will have some requirements, the data model, and uh, you know it will put some um, time. I, I, I like the way it will. Uh, consolidate everything that we've been doing. So um, we hope if all, everyone has heard that if there is a co-author, so person that would like to, to, to get involved, you know, you need to, to contact Pascal. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, we're switching to uh, Dominic. Hello, thank you. So uh, this is just a, an informal account of uh, interrupt testing for Czech. Um, the, the people doing the work are Laurent, Cédric, Olivier, uh, and myself, I'm just writing the PowerPoint. Um, this was meant to be done at the hackathon uh, at ITF 107, um, but many um, authors said they would not fly to Vancouver anyway uh, long before the thing was canceled. It was going to be mostly virtual. Um, so we started earlier, early on uh, thinking what we would do if we were not at the same time in the same place. So basically we said we would start with uh, test vectors, things that people can apply locally uh, to the implementation and check if it works as expected. And so what we have now, which is well defined, is a a suite of four uh, test cases where we have uh, golden vectors uh, uh, generated. Uh, we use uh, OpenShift to generate them, but of course we're ready to discuss about any uh, disagreement. Uh, the four uh, cases we have is uh, only compression, 
uh, and we started by uh, you know the, the obvious ones, the compression where well, the, the compression rule does not match, so it's a no compression compression uh, with aligned headers, everything byte aligned. So this is very simple. It checks the, the matching logic. Um, then the second one is slightly more elaborate, but we have unaligned headers are not byte aligned, so it checks the uh, bit shifting ability of the implementation a little bit. Then we have a, a real compression where we do apply uh, compression. Um, we elide some fields and recompute some fields. That's the third case. And the fourth case, we also go into the match mapping. So we check against the list and send the index into the list, which is, again, a little bit more elaborate. So, so far, we've got, uh, so OpenShake, of course, is uh, one implementation that is tested and it's also the generator for the golden vectors. And we've worked with uh, LibCheck uh, by University of Ghent uh, about months uh, uh, quite extensively. And we had contact with PyCheck uh, in the University of Chile as well. But I think for the last few weeks, few months, uh, nothing, not, not lot, a lot has happened on that front. So we, we are eager to reconnect with with them and everybody. So the next steps are provide more test vectors in terms of things that can be applied offline and going into fragmentation. The no arc fragmentation mode does not have a feedback path, so it's obvious to generate golden vectors for this mode as well. So we want to do that. I think Laurent just uh, did that or generated some yesterday, so it's very recent. And we also want to implement the online testing where we have multiple implementa implementation running against one another, uh, each other in real time. And we have a little bit on that. Olivier has written an MQTD connector on TTN, the Flink network for LoRaWAN, and he was able to check uh, LibCheck implementation on a a board, microcontroller board against uh, another implementation, I think it was OpenShift on the cloud side. And Long also uh, is working on a, a server by which you could uh, run uh, implementations uh, via EDP against uh, one another. Um, and of course, uh, we want to improve OpenShift as well. Uh, the connect as, uh, as we've just mentioned, so that we can do local simulation or uh, interoperability testing. And also the internals of OpenCheck, not everything is, is perfect yet, so we still have some work there. And that's it for me. Olivier or Laurent, if you want to add some details. The, the connector is for OpenShake. The MQT connector is for, is for OpenShake server, and it's not done yet. There is still work to do. Yes, two things. First, I think you forgot a Clio in the list of uh, applications that does uh, this. Uh, test. You are missing something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other point is that we, we are trying to install uh, an OpenShake uh, in, uh, in the server that can be reached either by UDP or uh, MQTT, and this way people will be able to play some uh, test again, uh, uh, reference implementation. Okay, and so, it would be running 24-7, so people um, can test at their own pace? Yeah. And so now in OpenShake, we, we have split uh, the two parts, so we have the device part and the core part. And so we will run the core part, and we will, will be able to play as a device player place again. Cool, uh, Dominic. Uh, I guess the ball is still yours. For okay. William. Okay. So uh, let's carry on. So this draft uh, well offers appear on the screen. Uh, it has not moved a lot uh, since a couple of years. 
now. Uh, last time we worked on it, we did some editorial changes, uh, shuffled things around, um, and we also decided we would move to the new uh, XML v3 uh, source code and add nice drawings. So I still have to learn that. Um, so I'm, I'm late on this. I still need to. Do I want to do that and, and learn this new set. Uh, now, on the technical front, um, we want to document stuff that is already implemented in OpenShift that you can match a packet with a chic rule and trigger an action as a proxy as opposed to doing compression or fragmentation. Um, we, can, we want to write examples. Um, we want to be more accurate on the, the ping behavior. We want to describe proxies. Uh, we want to discuss a trace route use case. Can we do something about that? Um, also, this discussion of uh, triggering a, a proxy action means uh, the, the ship core on the infrastructure side is more like a router, and so shall it decrease TTL or hop count, hop limit. Um, so this makes us uh, rethink the architecture diagram, so we want to um, work on that as well. Um, and of course, we have to discuss security considerations as always. So quite a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, and so, yes, we've been discussing that between the co-authors, uh, I think, in February last time. And we said we would bring that to the open on the mailing list so we get input uh, from the working group. So I still have to do that. And that's it for me. Thanks again, uh, Dominique. And so I will get back uh, to the ball. So I, I see that Mr. Iria, first name was in, uh, with us. Um, so is that you, Jeff, or please please behave outside of lobby area? I can't quite hear you, Pascal. Can you speak louder? Uh, sorry, again, the mic problem. So, so um, there is somebody called Rotting Area. So I guess it's Jeff or no? Hey, uh, Pascal Alvaro. Alvaro, okay. Yeah, well, I can't get Webex to lock me off. So. Uh, that's okay. I just needed the name for this. Thank you, Alvaro. Oh, it's really nice to have the Rotting Area joining the, the working group. And with this, I will uh, move to the um, interim. Uh, multicast slide. So, who's presenting now? Juan Carlos, Olivier? Uh, I can present. Okay, Juan Carlos, I'm giving you the, the role. And then we'll add Alvaro to the machine. Yes, thank you. So, this is uh, a recap. Uh, we, we heard about the multicast uh, in the intro by Alex. Uh, this is a topic that we discussed uh, briefly and we were considering as part of the rechartering. And we had a, a discussion at one of our interims, but the crowd was uh, rather small. And at the time, we decided to, to leave it out for the time being until, until we discussed a bit more and we had a draft to rely on before asking IESD to put it on the, on the charter. So the purpose of this presentation is to do a recap of that discussion and to to have a common understanding on, on, on our mindset uh, when we talk about multicast. So uh, basically the, the, the thing is uh, we believe, and there's people that believe that there's a great benefit for multicast services for several reasons in low power wide area networks. And the reasons could be software or firmware updates, network policies, or a simple uh, traffic uh, broadcast of multicast, et cetera. And we also know that there are some technologies that already support uh, multicast services. However, uh, right now the, the Chic protocol or RC8724 only considers uh, unicast data delivery services. So we can think of uh, several alternatives to deliver this, uh, these services. Uh, one of them could be, for instance, a non-reliable uh, multicast fragmentation support in case we wanted to send uh, bigger data frames. 
and uh, an example could be to do multicast over chic and the, in the NOAC mode. Uh, there could be also some options to have reliable multicast fragmentation support, uh, in which case we can think of uh, ARQ over chic, uh, for instance, uh, doing some uh, unicast stack on error response to the multicast uh, transmissions. Uh, there, we can also think of uh, forward error correction in lower layers or some other mechanisms at the application layer. Uh, at the at the last uh, interim when we discussed this topic, uh, Pascal also mentioned the, the trickle algorithm, uh, which uh, potentially with some variant could be considered as a, as an option. I personally uh, still have a lot of questions uh, on this one because uh, right now, for at least for LP1, we talk about uh, start topologies and not uh, mesh. So. Um, I, I still not uh, not very clear on how we could uh, transport the trickle algorithm uh, mindset to uh, to a start topology, but still something to to be considered. Um, and then uh, we talk about uh, considering this IETF uh, working group. Uh, if this is uh, really a potential work item, so uh, the baseline is that uh, right now we we understand and we agree that there are several solutions for providing multicast services. Some of them at the lower layers, either layer one, layer two. Uh, there could be also solutions on layer three or uh, even at higher layers. Uh, likewise, there could be centralized or distributed solutions uh, to provide these multicast services. And of course, not all of these uh, solutions would be in scope for the IETF LP1 working group. So right now where we stand and it's proposed to, to document at least here, uh, what are the needs uh, identify the potential solutions, and then uh, with some uh, draft discuss, discuss if there's some solutions that would be in, indeed in scope for this uh, LP1 working group. And that's pretty much uh, where we are right now with regards to multicast. Are there any questions? I have one that's actually queued at Mr. LP1. But that's me. Um, yes, uh, Juan Carlos, this is Pascal. Uh, I wanted to, to give you more hints about this uh, discussion we had on the uh, trickle. So the idea was uh, that even if we haven't think, we, we, we still have multiple quote unquote gateways that can receive any given uh, packet from um, a, a device. And so the idea was to consider n now a, a whole area where you want to distribute this thing and devices being spread in this area and antennas being also spread in this area, not talking about mesh at all, but uh, from above, you still have a distribution of antennas and a gateway, so the distribution of, of devices scattered in the middle of, of the gateway. And so basically finding uh, dominating sets of antennas, and by a dominating set, I mean uh, a set of antennas that globally cover the whole area. So each device being capable to receive from at least one member of the dominating set. And having more than one dominating set, that's where trickle comes into play. So what you would be doing is, initially you would schedule for the first fragment of your reliable distribution. You would ask each of the gateway, the first everything set to send it once maybe, and then ask a bit later with an exponential back off like trickle dance, um, another set to, to stand again. So that means that each device would get an opportunity to receive first from one gateway, second from another gateway, third from a third gateway, knowing that those gateways each time you, you, you send your trickle uh, copies of the same fragment the portion of your multicast, um, the station would have multiple chances to receive this thing with the exponential backup. Now, it still means that there needs to be either a schedule at which the device wake up or that the device must be always listening. In other terms, that means B or C. Um, this model would not work for devices which live on their own schedule like class A. But for, for BRC, uh, you could actually 
make it so that this dominating set of antennas cover the whole area. That's the game. I'm not talking about just one antenna talking to a set of devices around that antenna, like a Wi-Fi IP. I'm more looking at a very large distribution over a wide area, which is covered by multiple antennas. That's more like that. So that's why. Well, thanks, Pascal. And, and, I, and I, I, yeah, I remember you, you, you mentioned that, and and um, of course uh, I was less aware of, of how trickle worked. And, and when when reading the the document, what I understood the about the algorithm is that it relies on nodes that have already received the information uh, to, to synchronize or basically to avoid uh, flooding information several times. And that, that's a part where I was uh, confused because uh, I couldn't really map on how, how to communicate uh, which nodes have received what to the network uh, without being in a, in a kind of... Trickle, trickle doesn't expect something, it's not reliable multicast, so there is never an acknowledgement. It's meant for uh, very dense uh, structures. Actually, the, the property of trickle is that it's uh, regardless of the density, really. You, you, you will repeat and repeat and repeat with an exponential back off um, in a such a fashion that everybody will have multiple chances to get the packet. But there will never an explicit uh, uh, acknowledgement. It's more like exponential back off for the fake, for the retry, without ever an acknowledgement. Um, and now the fact that it actually spreads in a mesh is a particular property when you use it on the mesh, meaning that you hear it and then you repeat it. But it's just an option. In our case, there would never be a repeat. It would just be uh, a dominating set of gateways, which would send a copy and then possibly the same or possibly another dominating set of gateways, which repeat and then another and then another. So, 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 just sorry, I'm jumping here. The queue uh, um, would that mean that um, it's not exactly trickle, but some form of trickle? So the document that um, Juan Carlos is talking about would potentially mean some adaptation of of what you mentioned as trickle to LP1. Yeah, we, we would, it's a variation, certainly. Yeah, and it's a, I, was, okay. I was thinking about using really trickle, uh, mm. meaning that the gateways who could not hear uh, another gateway speak, it would also speak. But then it doesn't appear to be the right idea. It's probably much better that the central uh, decision uh, the network server, quote unquote, decides which gateways are going to send the first round and then which gateways are going to send the second round because they have, uh, the network servers know which gateways form a dominating set and they can design one or more dominating sets. So it's, it's much more powerful to actually do the computation of uh, who gets to repeat from the central point. I mean, that's what's really what Nicolas Sorna told me when we discussed this idea and I, I think he was right. It's much more elegant applied to LP1 to, to let the central server decide what the dominating sets are. Okay, so as yeah. the time is going, I would I would say about the trickle. Let let go. Let's continue the discussion, and if there is a couple of minutes in the end, we can get back if you wish. Okay. Yeah. So so thanks, uh, Alex. Uh, well, all in all, uh, as I said, there there are several alternatives. Some some are, I guess straightforward if we did some some variation of chic we, we could for sure say uh, this is something that is in scope for the, for the working group if, uh, if there's a solution that is on a different layer uh, then probably out of scope and uh, there could be some other variants as, uh, as the triple one that Pascal is saying that relies on on this uh, distribution of information that algorithm to provide an unreliable uh, multicast distribution but anyway at, at this point uh, uh, we have no draft yet, so the idea is to document uh, knowing no other the, the, the problem statement, uh, the, the, the needs, uh, and, and then the potential solutions, uh, so that we can have a, a constructive discussion on, on what to, uh, in terms of uh, what's in scope for this working group. Uh, Juan Carlos, if you want a little bit help on the case of the quote unquote trickle solution, then I can. Give you a paragraph or two. I would be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so there's there's Diego in the in the queue and uh, Pascal. That will be really great. Um, so sorry, yeah, I wanted to say there is Diego in the queue. Yeah, uh, just uh, to to look for the applications. I think if you want to to enable um, the uh, enable discovery or some other services which need multicast packets uh, as the on, on OEM, maybe that will be a good use of this multicast. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So. Uh, I put myself in the queue just uh, right after, and then I can give back the, the, the word to, to Pascal about. So uh, uh, thanks very much, um, uh, Juan Carlos and Olivier, for uh, co-presenting, for co-authoring this presentation. Um, I, I, I really like the way that uh, we that actually have outlined the three main possibilities, and um, basically there are what what I, I I see that it's really nice is to have this this document that actually identifies the needs and where we can actually have the discussion of what we want to to achieve. Um, and um, I would like you know uh, uh, with a chair hat on, I would like to to see uh, 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 you know the technologies that actually provide some input. I mean, I would like to see for us providing solutions that are actually demanded by someone, you know, and not have something really beautiful and really abstract, but that has no practical use. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say no practical use, but you know, that's a little bit uh, uh, maybe not, yeah, not, not used uh, directly. So it's really great to have uh, you guys, uh, Juan Carlos and Olivier, as co-authors of this one, and uh, with, in, with Pascal's input. And I, I think that we can have a very good baseline, and then we can um, uh, actually go and, and uh, develop the. Uh, if 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 LP1 is the the place, we can actually go and uh, work on the on the documents. So I, I really like your presentation. Thank you, thank you for for the work. Okay, so do Sorry, Pascal, there was some noise when you spoke. Can you repeat? Yeah, I'm sorry. It seems that my mic is getting broken. It was fine last time I used it, but today it seems to very uh, bother us. So I was asking if there is any more questions. No more questions? Okay, so unless you want more details about what I was saying about trick or um I guess we we're done with this multicast. So that means that we are in the AOB section. So um, do we have any other business? And again if you want me to discuss more this trick or thing I can do that. Well, the, the the point would be maybe um, 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 like the initial input from Vivian and Juan Carlos. Does the trickle thing that you are uh, that you are presenting does it um, sound something interesting on a first uh, on a uh, like uh, in a first uh, reaction or or maybe it's better to take this one offline. I don't know. Uh, at least from from my side, I still have a, a, a few questions. Maybe uh, I will take that offline uh, with Pascal because again, the, the way I understood that the, the protocol was to rely on states of uh, what information has been distributed and updated based on on the receivers and as well the receivers updating the transmitters on what is the latest that they have heard. So that it was hard for me to map that into our our network architecture, but. Uh, but then, then uh, as uh, Pascal is saying, he probably has something a little more uh, uh, digested in mind that that, real, uh, that is actually a non-reliable distribution that has some backup algorithm to to avoid flooding the network. 
okay so it's more um no you don't rely on explicit acknowledgement from the receiver it's more like normally it's a flooding mechanism right so people hear and then they may repeat unless there is already a density of repeat in their environment. So we, for LP1, we would take the repeat thing off. We don't repeat anything. It's, so you can see it as uh, selecting a subset of the gateways of the antennas that cover a certain area. And um, so that's why it's, that's what I call a dominating set, meaning that each device is covered by at least one antenna in this dominating set. And having those selected antenna sound fragment one, say we use um, just fragments with NOAC, your first proposal. Mm -hmm. So we use fragments with NOAC as you suggested. Uh, and maybe you could use any of your other mechanisms. It's just, it's more like, which antennas, which gateways are going to sound this first element, and then, and then, and then the, I guess the, the the way I understood trickle is that you have you take that decision uh, because you inform the antenna on whether the information has already been received, and, and that's the the first question, and, and the second question is, uh, do we require overlapping uh, in, uh, co uh, coverage from the from the antennas for this to work? Because if there's one single antenna covering one single device, then I guess mm. there's no question, right? Well, huh. you, you need each time. So, so the idea is because there is no explicit acknowledgement from the devices, the idea is that you have to do FEC. You sound the same element several times with an exponential backup. So far, so good. It's kind of brute force. Now, um, should we select the same set of gateways every time? The idea is no. Uh, we should put as much diversity as we can. Uh, so if there is one device which is covered by only one antenna, then by definition, as that's your question, that antenna will be in every dominating set that you form. Because the dominating set has to cover everybody. But the idea is for us, would be to elect from the central office each the dominating set for the first transmission, for the retransmission, for the retransmission number two, etc. And oh. normally, Tricor elects those dominating sets automatically uh, by hearing the transmission. Okay. Here, we would skip this. We would just say, hey, we have predefined what those dominating sets are. Um, the whole idea being that we don't act, we do brute force, we repeat over and over a good number of times, and with an exponential back off in the, the time between resending elements, till the point where we have a confidence that the large majority of devices have received the thing. And only after that, if there are still devices which did not receive, that's when the kind of, uh, if you want something more reliable, that's when the devices could come and say, hey, I, I have, I've missed this particular fragment, please you cast it to me. But it would be done only after an exponential back off of retries by various gateways. The idea of changing the dominating set of gateways for every retransmission is to add diversity and that's actually a key point in, in LP1 to have multiple gateways that can actually uh, be in range for a particular device. So if the first try is done by one gateway, second try is done by another gateway, uh, you have more chances that the device ultimately gets it. And it's good for your duty cycle as well. It's good for the duty cycle as well. Yeah, completely. So, so um, uh, I see also the the time is running, and thanks, uh, Pascal. That sounds also really really interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll have maybe a, a question for the working group, and that will be a place to hum, but maybe not, not the, maybe not here. But if you have a plus one uh, on the chat, so um, do you maybe be a, a first input for the authors? Um, 
Do you think that uh, we, you know, the, the question that the way it is asked, you know, to have this document that outlines the the uh, the, the the problem statement of what we want to of what the group would like to achieve as open multicast? Do you think that this is something um, that is of interest of, of you? Of, you know, like, of, that's of interest in general. Sure. Okay. okay. So I, I see a lot of plus ones uh, in the whoa, lots of plus ones. Uh, so uh, okay, I, I think that this means that we have quite a lot of interests um, in the in the working group. Um, so that will be uh, for me uh, 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 an excellent indication that. Um, uh, we need to go forward with this document, and um, so I think that that could be also very reassuring for you, Juan Carlos and, and Olivier. You know that um, um, you'll have support for for your document, uh, and uh, and yeah, we we know that Pascal has a lot of input to give on the on the trickle part. So I think uh, we'll have uh, interesting times with the multicast here. So with that said, it's uh, the uh, end of the hour for our LP1 working group uh, interim meeting. Um, thank you very much, everyone. If you have any last word to add, now is the time. It's too late. <laughs> no. If you, uh, do you have any 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 last last words to add? No. So well, thank you very much, everyone, and um, enjoy the rest of the time of your bye. Life. Bye bye. Good night. See you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for the productive meeting. Thanks. And thanks. Thanks to you. Good chance. Take care bye. and keep very safe during this period. Stay at home. Yes.